Hello, BookTube. I no sooner stopped that last video about my morning UPS delivery than I got another shipment. I got the mail, the, the U.S. mail truck. Tom from Tipperary came by very early, six hours early. Uh, no real explanation. And But in between that video and this one, I actually did a little watching of BookTube and saw a video by Bald Book Geek, which he, he says, asked the question, is BookTube making us shallow? And then I saw Indy Insomniac's response to that about is BookTube making us shallow? The, the, the whole discussion revolves around not only collectors who are getting multiple different editions of the same book, but also a little bit touching on the, the magpie aspect of some parts of BookTube where people just hold up their swag and we very much get the impression that they care more about the swag than they do about the content. Uh, and now I feel a little guilty. <laughs> Because I'm holding up new books all the time on this channel. I've got another stack of them here to hold up in front of you. And, and there, is there a way that that could be construed as making the things worse? Am I helping to make book two shallow? I want, in my own defense, I want to offer a, a couple of defenses for all these new things that I hold up uh, on camera. Uh, defense number one would be that I read almost all of them. They aren't, they aren't for show. And defense number two would be that I write about a lot of them. <laughs> I review a lot of them. Act, I'm an active book reviewer. I'm, I'm hoping that that, <laughs> that gets me a pass on just being, you know, a showboat. <laughs> Maybe I'll make a whole video on the subject. But in the, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't like the idea that I'm making things worse. <laughs> uh, but I, I have more things to show you here. And then... Uh, and then I think I want to make a Manuscript Monday video. I haven't, I haven't been religious about that, but I, I, uh, there have been developments on the Manuscript front. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that. But first, let's do some mindless showcasing. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, first one is by Max de Charnay. It's called Vulgar Tongues, an Alternative History of English Slang. That's what it looks like there. Uh, slang is the language of pop culture, low culture, street culture, underground movements, and secret societies. Depending on your point of view, it is a badge of honor, a sign of identity, or a dangerous assault on the values of polite society. Hmm. Okay, so this is a history of slang from, from Elizabethan times to the present. Uh, and the author is a writer and musician. He writes about music regularly for Mojo Magazine, where he is their chief authority on the subject of rockabilly. <laughs> okay. All right. I wonder how hard it is to become a chief authority. <laughs> oh, but he's written for the Times Literary Supplement. I haven't. <laughs> he's the author of six books, so, so this will be a smooth ride. All right, so Vulgar Tongues, a history of, uh, of slang. Uh, this shipment does not end with a box, but it does end with a gigantic envelope. So it's, it's almost as good. Uh, and then what do we have here? This is... Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> All right, this is uh, mid-April. This, this was the... No, we not only saw this on this channel before, but it was the occasion for a little rant. <laughs> this is Who Lost Russia. This is the finished copy of Who Lost Russia. Uh, which, oh, isn't that nice? Look at that. Uh, this is... Mm, the embossed cover and everything. They did a good job on this. Uh, and of course, I, when I was when I was ranting about it earlier, I, in that the previous time that we saw it for the ARC, I was ranting about the uh, the accommodation factor involved in the 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 way that the book seemed to imply that we are to blame for Russia's evil, uh, and. You know, you can just imagine how much more complicated that thought is, in my, and how much more emphatic that thought in my head is now, because every day we learn more about Russia's complicity with our own government. <laughs> every day we learn more about that. So, so a, a former Russian oil executive who promises uh, one of candidate Trump's main aides de camp a sweet deal on a Russian oil commission if the aide can guarantee that Trump will lift economic sanctions when he comes to power that aide 
goes to Russia for a trip whose reason is unknown during the campaign. He hasn't talked about it. In fact, he warned Senator John McCain not to bring it up. <laughs> and while he's in Russia, that former Russian oil executive is found dead, found murdered in the back of a car with, with two bullets in his head. <laughs> and, and Trump lifted sanctions and, and a, a sale of the exact same percentage of the oil commission that had been promised was remarked upon in the Russian news. It did happen. We, no, one's, no one's bothering to follow the money, but someone got paid. It's as clear as could be, and there are now dead bodies on the story. <laughs> so I, I didn't actually read the galley of this thing. I, reading the finished copy, I think, will be more complex than usual. This just couldn't be any clearer, a kleptocracy, and that's horrible. And uh, I'm not sure that the, the, uh, the, the Peter, Peter Conradi, the author here, I'm not sure how much of that he could even have anticipated when he was writing his book. Uh, so we'll see. There are new books to be written already. <laughs> but, uh, but let's move on here. Just in case the sun gets too fractious. You see, I don't want you people constantly dealing with glare on this channel. <laughs> I'm brilliant enough as it is. <laughs> All right, what have we got here? Uh, okay, this is called Sonata, a memoir of pain and the piano by Andrea Avery who holds an MFA from Arizona State University and teaches English in Phoenix. This is her debut, and it is a memoir. Um, Andrea, already a promising and ambitious classical pianist at the age of 12, was diagnosed with a severe case of rheumatoid arthritis that threatened not just her musical aspirations, but her ability to live a normal life. As Andrea navigates the pain and frustration of coping with rheumatoid arthritis alongside the usual travails of puberty, college, sex, and growing up. Can you imagine? She turns to music, specifically Franz Schubert's Sonata in B-flat D960, and the one-armed pianist Paul Wittgenstein for strength and inspiration. The heartbreaking story of this mysterious sonata, Schubert's last and his most elusive and haunting, is the soundtrack of Andrea's story. Sonata is a coming-of-age story that explores a Janus-headed miracle, Andrea's extraordinary talent and even more extraordinary illness, in a manner reminiscent of Brain on Fire and Poster Child. Wow. Okay. That sounds fascinating. Rheumatoid arthritis at age 12. God. I know, I know quite a lot. I'm, I'm very old, so I know quite a few people who, who deal with rheumatoid arthritis, and it's, it's hell. I can't imagine Every single old person that I know, every single person, every, every old person I know who deals with rheumatoid arthritis, they all, even though they don't know each other, they all say a variation of the same thing when I ask them about it. They're, not, they're all of a generation that doesn't like to complain about their woes, but if I ask them persistently, they will respond, and when they do, they all say a variation of the same thing. Well, at least I can have, I have my memories of when I didn't have it. It was most of my life that I was perfectly able to open, you know, a, a bottle of water or turn the remote on the TV. Uh, I can't do those things anymore, but I can at least remember when I could. She doesn't even get that. She's never had that. Wow. Wow. Now I want, I want to read the thing right away, even though I put it mildly, don't like memoirs. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, all right. So we go from the very serious to the very silly. <laughs> but that's okay. That's just what we want. Uh, this comes out in May. This is Murderous Mayhem at Honeychurch Hall. This is a in, in English aristocracy cozy murder mystery <laughs> in the tradition of mc beaton yes okay uh when the only copy of ravished iris stanfield's new manuscript never arrives at her london publisher's office her daughter cat investigates the tiny local village post office where it appears the package never left the building iris is on tenterhooks not only is her novel gone with the wind but she's deathly afraid that muriel jarvis the postmistress and notorious busybody will expose her secret identity as the best-selling romance writer, Cristal Storm. <laughs> Meanwhile, Muriel has her own problems with the sudden death of her husband, Fred, which has only left her heavily in debt, and the spine-tingling climax both past and present collide as Cat fights for her life behind and those she holds most dear, dancing once again with dark forces lurking behind the grandeur of Honey her Honeychurch Hall. Okay, so this isn't the first one in the Honeychurch Hall series, but you can see from that description 
uh, the signature of the cozy murder mystery. Notice, notice that uh, the the hijinks and the tanter hooks and the worrying about a secret identity and the mean postmistress down in the village. Notice how all of that gets top billing, and then it, it, halfway, two thirds of the way through, oh, and yeah, somebody dies. <laughs> that's that's a hallmark of the cozy murder mystery is the oh yeah somebody dies <laughs> the murder is very much not the point in in such things uh then we have uh this thing here i love i love stuff like that so if 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 you know not i'm not a steady diet if i knew someone once who, who, who read nothing but these things i don't know how that wouldn't rot your brain uh but once in a in a while i love them uh oh great oh fantastic Okay, uh, okay. This comes out next week in paperback. This is a paperback release of a brief stop on the road from Auschwitz by Goran Rosenberg, and it's one of those books that uh, that gives gives me a little guilt and a little a little happiness with showing up in a in a hall uh, because I never got to it when it first came out. I, I got the galley. I got the finished copy. I always, I always meant to do it, and I never got around to it. Never. Uh, so now I have the paperback, I will, definitely. It's, uh, it's a novel, and I never, I never got to it. Uh, I wonder if we have a, a workable description here. Since you have to go by my words, the sun is proving problematic. Uh, on the 2nd of August, 1947, a young man gets off a train in a small Swedish town to begin his life anew. Having survived the ghetto of Lutz and the death camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau, the harrowing slave camps, and the transports during the final months of Nazi Germany, his final challenge is to survive the survival. In this beautiful, powerful, and deeply moving book, Gora Rosenberg turns to his own childhood in order to tell the story of his father, walking at his side, holding his hand, following him along the road from Auschwitz, trying to get close to him again. It is also the story of the chasm that soon opens between the world of the child, permeated by optimism, progress and collective oblivion to post-war Sweden and the world of the father darkened by the long shadows of the past this is not yet an, this is not yet another book about Auschwitz but about that which came after a world of silence suppression oblivion guilt and shame okay uh, all right this is out the end of February I will uh, I'm very happy to have a chance to go at this again this I, I that's that's one of the things. Even with a with a, I'm a, I'm a busy reader. I'm an active reader. I try to to keep my head above water when it comes to new releases, but I can't get to them all. And even 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 I sometimes miss things that just shriek of quality. That do shriek the kind of thing that isn't, you know, mayhem at Honey Church Hall. The kind of thing where you really should read it. And I still don't get around to it. So uh, this gives me a chance to do that. Uh, and then the last thing we have to deal with is oh, this. Here, which, uh, had to be the publisher had to staple it closed. It's it's so big. How's the visual on this? It's not quite as bad as that that, that debacle of Chris and Giselle. Oh, ha, 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 no wonder it almost bursts out of here. This is yet another galley copy of the House of Government uh, by Yuri Zleskine. Look at the size of that thing. <laughs> Oh my, yes. This is a history of the, of the Russian Revolution, but I actually read this this weekend, and it's much more than that. It's, uh... I'm still sorting out what I think about it, but it's it's an amazing work. It really is. It's not just a history of the Russian, Russian Revolution. It's 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 more than that. It's it's an amazing book. <laughs> it's, it's a narrative tour de force, just... <laughs> I'll, I'll figure out what I uh, what I have to say about it, but it reminded me a lot more of the Gulag Archipelago than it did any history th that I've read of this exact subject matter. It, it reminded me of that or of the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shire. It read, it read something that is everybody's concerned with its narrative power as it is with just being a history. Uh, wow, great, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, in the dodgy sunlight here, we have uh, the House of Government, an enormous book that I will have a lot more to say about. Uh, then we have Vulgar Tongues, about the history of slang. We have Who Lost Russia. Uh, we have Sonata, by a young woman who has rheumatoid arthritis for her whole life. Uh, Murder's Mayhem at Honey Church Hall, uh, and A Brief Stop on the Road to Auschwitz. I don't know how much of that is visible, but that is the... Uh, 
my second extra shallow mail haul. <laughs> and I'll, I'll see you soon, BookTube. Preferably when the lighting's a little better. Thank you.